The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology and mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often over and over again. As soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit. The three of us pray a lot about this series. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect. And we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. questions in these final uh, sections have been around um, our attendees want help putting these ideas, these rich ideas on the ground. Uh, we, have, we have heard some amazing um, theological and missiological reflection on race and on the, the cost of the colonial enterprise. We've named the demons of white supremacy and empire in a, in a myriad of ways. But what is the church to do about, the, about these things? And so I just want to um, just throw out a general question right now. If you were giving advice to a, a leader called by God to engage in missions, what advice would you give them? Would it matter what their own social location would be? Would your, would your advice vary? How would you advise them to prepare themselves? Please, just jump in. Yeah, I think, oh, yeah. That's a very, that's a very, very important question. And I, my, 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 my feeling is that, is that, is that everyone, not just the pastor, or not just the pastor. Everyone should be vigilant, should be, should be, 
should be a watch. You know, I, I, I started my presentation by using a quotation by Mark Eller. Mark Eller called for, for this, you know, the need to be a watchman. But in order to be inclusive, you know, watch people. So men and women should be, should be vigilant and must be able to do theology and missiology with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Uh, so, so with the Bible in one hand and the and and the newspaper in the other. So, so, so this is this is a need to be conscientized, to use you know conscientization, to use this you know popular lingo from Paul Paulo Fieri, to be conscientized, to be aware, to be there, and and also to 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 understand to understand that the Christian gospel allows us to think. This is actually quoting Edward Shibelek. Edward Shibelek says, you know, the Bible, the Christian theology, allows us to think, to, to reflect, and to understand what's going on in the, in the society. So being watchful, being vigilant, and also being conscientized. Yeah. And thank you for that. I was thinking the just... Uh, about your effort here to be a church that is relevant for the 21st century United States. Now, what, it, what does it mean to be a church in the 21st century here in the places where uh, you are living? So, and the, for the passionate questions, I am, I am very grateful for that. So here, I thought uh, there are two things. Number one, uh, we need to include more people into our conversation. Uh, see, for example, all the Native Americans and their theologians, where are they? And we are sitting on their land, isn't it? And uh, whether uh, I do not want to use the color and names, white or black or whatever it is, uh, we are guests. The hosts are there. But without the hosts, a lot of things are being discussed and done. So it will be good to consult them, to include them into this discussion. And uh, the picture in the United States, it seems, is much bigger than what we have been uh, doing over these years, over these days. For example, there's a vast number of people now from India, from China, from Japan, and from other countries, and they need to be included into this discussion. Otherwise, they will feel excluded. Because they are now U.S. citizens, and many of them here are here at home. It will be good in future to um, include them. So where do we begin? Seminary, I think, is a good place to begin. It's the place where we sow seeds. That's all it means. Seminary means it's a seed bed where you sow seeds. And not for the seed to stay there, but to grow. Once it is grown, then it will be transplanted elsewhere. That's the exact meaning of the word seminary. Sow the seed. And how? where should we be, get the seed? I think we need to have a much bigger understanding. When I, there are two things that troubled me in the, in the con, in the, uh, in the, during these days. One is the word America. The better would be United States. Yes, please. Uh, as, as if you are standing for the whole two continents. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And that is a big troublesome thing for me. United States, okay. That you can go by. <laughs> The second one that troubled me uh, to some extent is the word minority. Yeah, right. Who told you you are a minority unless you accept it? Oh, yeah. oh. We say we are children of God. Then you think I am a minority person. And may, maybe for political reasons others may call it unless and until you accept your minority status, you are not minority. So working with a great God who transcends all boundaries should make us also worldwide a, a kind of great vision. That I thought. And finally, when United States is a young country. Please don't forget it. <laughs> you know, and then it is, uh, yeah, it's nearly 300 years. And if it is Latin America, it's about 500 years and 20 but there are bigger civilizations, much older civilizations, and we need to learn from them. Civilizations rose and fell down and disappeared. What things made them to stand up and then grow? So where do we begin in this whole concept? I thought 
you have sent many, many missionaries to outside, but I am sad to say the missionaries left their own people bankrupt. The intercultural learning has not taken place. So that missionaries have been all the time thinking people from in other parts of the world are inferior, bad, and this and that. But in that way, they robbed their own people the opportunity to learn the good things from others. I think now is the time that we in our own generation tell how good God has been and God is and God will be. Thank you, friends, for this wonderful opportunity. Others? Want to jump in on that? When we say the church, there are a lot of assumptions. Because when I think of the church where I have pastored, there are a lot of things that are different. What does an immigrant church need? What has the trauma of immigration done? Because immigration is a trauma. And if not, then you try moving to Turkey and figuring out how to do that. <laughs> so, what is it that empowers a people? Because a lot of this is about being empowered. Do you come and empower me? And then you go, I am empowered. So what does that take? And as a pastor, where is the pastor coming from? I'm second generation. But if you're a first generation pastor, what does that mean? So we need connections. But we need the right connections. It does more harm when you come to reach out to me and the power pieces are not the same. So I'm here as a first generation to begin with. I may not know your language, but you want me to do everything in your language. One of the things that I did <laughs> when we went to denominational meetings is that my people had a lot of wonderful things to say. And I would say, get up and say it and say it in Spanish. <laughs> and they would get up and say it in Spanish. And you know, nosotros hablamos así, tú sabes con las manos y todo lo que hay. <laughs> and then they would say, and then they would sit, right? And then they would say, well, is anyone going to translate? I said, oh, I'm sorry, you're not bilingual? <laughs> right? so that they realize what that means. So what does it mean for us to come to each other's spaces, right? So as a pastor, who I am as a pastor is going to matter a great deal. That's why theological education and the issues of theological education are so important. Because the pa who I am as a pastor is the first resource that that church and that community has. Yeah? <laughs> and that's why Fuller or any theological entity that's teaching has to really ask, what does that mean? And then spheres of influence. What is your sphere of influence? How does it touch me so that your influence brings resources that otherwise I couldn't have. Spheres of influence are very important. Yeah? Because it's power sharing. Yeah? It's power sharing. So before we have these, you know, lofty ideals of the church, which church? Where are we, the, the situation, the place? Mm -hmm. Where are we in all of those places? Mm -hmm. What are the gifts that we all bring? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do we bring those out? Mm -hmm. What does it mean in what languages, etc.? And language is not a barrier. It really isn't. 
Not when we're in the spirit. <laughs> I mean, I'm like for real, right? I'm not trying to be like, you know, according to the calculation of the matriculation theology, right? <laughs> I'm just talking about experience for real. When we're in the spirit and when we know that we're across the street from each other and we have to reach out to each other. Or when you've heard my voice at a meeting and we're there for one another, something happens because what the Spirit does to create mission is vinculos. Everybody say that word for me, vinculos. And vinculos is what makes us the church because they are the tissues. We talk about organs and skeletons and tissues are the connective pieces that make everything function together in the body. Vinculos are the bonds that grow between us. So when I come to places, I don't come to network. I come to listen to the spirit for the vinculos that are to be formed. Because you see, maybe I don't like you, and maybe you don't like me, but that doesn't matter because there's a set of gifts that you were given in that body, and there's a set of gifts that I have, and we're supposed to do this together. So let's get over it. <laughs> let's do it. Because in the doing, we'll figure out how to like each other. Because the focus is not what we like. The focus is what needs to happen. Yeah? Who do I serve? Right? Lordship. Who am I serving? Okay? So that's the big piece. And then we know the, the vinculo. Now we can receive the vision. You all want to go out and have visions. <laughs> You need vinculos. You need, how, you need to learn how to live in the vinculos before you get the vision. Because the vision doesn't come to one. The vision comes to the many together. Okay? And so we are vision impaired. So we need that together, right? And the critical thinking piece, is part of the spiritual disciplines that are needed. So I'll just leave it there for now. But remember, <laughs> vinculos, vinculos. Otherwise, this is just another conference. All right, all right, all right. But if it's going to be something that we're doing together, vinculos. Yes, yes. Okay. So one of the um, themes that's already come out, I think, have, has been um, the question of dealing with power. I, I heard that in uh, Dr. Jayaraj's uh, comment about minorities, minority status. Um, and and I, I have to admit, the first thing that I thought as I was listening um, yeah, was the, yeah, but what about the whole power imbalance? Um, that is not something that I want to cooperate with, but, but that's not going to help me if I'm stopped by a cop at, a night, at night on the wrong side of town, right? Like that, that minority status is forced upon me. So this, this came up a couple of times in, in our conference. Um, I remember uh, Grace Dernis, um, one of her questions uh, the first night was, uh, how, how deep is our Christianity? How should we embody the biblical concept of power, thinking of others, being servant, not the served? How can we embody the Jesus of power versus the Jesus of not power? And then I, I asked a question in my head back to her. How do minority communities embody power? Is it safe for them? to embody the suffering Jesus? And, or does that matter? Mm. 
say that. Yeah, yes. See, in India, uh, the Christians make out 2.4 percent. And uh, according to the government, uh, things, they are minority by number. But you ask a Christian whether they ever feel minority. That's not the case. Because in doing, for example, their educational work, their medical work, that outweighs far, far greater than their numerical strength. So it, it has been a, the refusal to accept, I am a minority, or other word that I do not understand much and do not also appreciate is the word ethnic. Because it puts somebody else in the middle, not <laughs> gives somebody else uh, importance, and we have to understand ourselves with reference to somebody else. Why should we do that? I, I have some trouble with that word. But um, in being as even as we may be small, but with God's help, we are somebody. And it is not because who we are, as we have said, it's together we are stronger. And I hope in doing that, it, it, it will be of great help. See, the, I hope the time should come very soon that cooperation should be real. In the, what does the history tell us? You know, the history tells we always learn from one another. Jesus is an Asian. So even the word, God whom we worship is an Asian. And where do we get the Bible from? We got it from Africa. And where did the ecclesiology come? Church structures is Cyprian. So most theology, African theology, I do not see whether uh, Europeans or Americans even creating something very new that has not been there. So they are asking African questions and uh, Asian questions and debate among themselves. So I think this particular issue is a wonderful opportunity to create a good North American or U US based theology to the world. Theology that is rooted in the life and comes out rather than recycling the ideas from Africa and Asia. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say that I appreciated Love's um, introduction to the plant, why it was up here. I thought it was for me, because um, I'm Vietnamese, and maybe the thought was I would be more comfortable near a plant like a jungle or something like that. <laughs> so, um, it was risky making that joke. Um, I think it goes along with what Professor Smith said earlier today, that none of us have a handle on this, and we're going to need a lot of space and a lot of generosity and a lot of goodwill, and I think a lot of laughing um, as we oh, make man. mistakes. I think at minimum what, um, what the temptation to post-racialism means or names is how much work we have in front of us. The force of post-racialism as a thought is to recognize how bad our situation is. And if there is not some part of you, I want to say, that feels tempted towards something like that, you haven't quite come to terms with how deadly of a moment we are in our lives. In answer to this question that, um, that Professor Seacrest just threw out, when I was invited to this, I was telling this to Amos and a few other people earlier, I, I kind of focused on the, the title of the conference, Fuller's Missions Conference. And I knew it was going to be about race, but it didn't quite register to me how much that was going to be the center of our conversation. Because if I knew, I would have prepared myself to enter to this, into this space in a different way. And that is to gird up and protect myself. Yeah. Because I found that as an Asian American in this place, um, it's not the claim that I don't have power. I do. I just don't know what to do with it in this space. Uh, I was talking to a really uh, brilliant um, uh, Barnabas from, he's on staff with InterVarsity at the University of Chicago. And he was, he was asking about this question about um, the, the, the issue of race um, and placelessness. And I thought that captured very well the sense I've had about what it means to be a minority in conversations like this. Not that I don't belong here, 
but these conversations illumine the sense that I don't belong anywhere. Uh, that, and that that is a permanent status for Asian folks. Uh, if you haven't read um, Vit um, Tan Nguyen's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Sympathizer, uh, at least in front, uh, on the male side of the Asian American experience, I think that book is the most powerful articulation of what it looks like to live in America and to inhabit power and ability and resources and privilege, but also violence and racism and under uh, disregard of what Asian American life looks like. Uh, and there's just an absolute homelessness to it. Uh, the recognition that you don't ever quite land anywhere. Uh, the recognition that, I mean, I, I've, I, I read a lot of race theory, a lot of um, uh, Latina thought, a lot of African American thought. And so I think about this a lot, but I often find myself in experiences where, where other minorities are race explaining to me yeah. what it means to be a minority. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, I, I had that experience when I first, I went to UC Riverside back in the day in the, in the beginning of the political correct, I mean, in the middle of the political correctness movement. I remember I got there and I was gonna join student government and you know, an older white student explained to me what it meant to be a minority. <laughs> and it, it was absurd and uh, embarrassing. It's, it's a very different thing when a minority does that to me. Uh, it's, um, yeah. it's painful in a, in a way that disregards in some sense, I'm sorry to my white, white brothers and sisters, I don't expect a lot of you guys to see who I am. Uh, I think that's part of whiteness. It's a, a far different experience when the same thing happens from someone who you see as a, a, a fellow journey person mm -hmm. in, in a way where you're trying to find home together mm -hmm. and, and then they don't see you. Um, and, and there's no doubt that there's a part of the Asian American um, experience in this country, what we have done, what we have done against others, uh, that you almost want to say that there's some level of desert in there. I, I get that. Um, but for so many of my Asian, Asian American brothers and sisters, the experience here uh, is I, I don't quite know if I belong here. I may actually be the token minority here. Mm. Um, and so, and, and this is just an experience I've had my entire time in academia um, to try to reckon with the kind of the placelessness um, of Asian American life. Uh, and, and, and it's not to, I, I really don't mean it as a complaint or a criticism. I'm not sure that if I were an African American person, a Latina woman, I wouldn't know what to do with me either. Um, I don't know if we have the conceptual resources. Um, and I say that as a person who fully believes that as a person entering into this country, I'm an immigrant, that it's right for me to live in the history of black and white. I, don't, I think there's a part of minority life that may resent that binary, but it's also the land that we live in. It, it has that blood in it. Um, and so I get all that, but then I'm not sure yeah. where, we, where, we're ought, where we ought to go or if there ever will be a place for us to go. We don't often see that communities of color don't necessarily get along either. And you don't necessarily know that until you've decentered whiteness. So when I've started a number of women of color organizations, they lasted for about two seconds before we had like fist fights and it quickly degenerated. And the thing that changed it is when we started organizing not based on the assumption that we actually supported each other. <laughs> we actually organized based on the assumption we were each other's enemies. And that the space we were in was going to be the most dangerous space we would ever have been in. And that we would have to become friends. It would have to be the political project to learn about each other, to develop alliances. We couldn't assume it. And when you no longer assume solidarity, there finally becomes the opportunity to create solidarity. Mm -hmm. And then with that, then I just think to, back to the advice to give to people is you're not going to figure it out on your own. You know, and in the academic industrial complex, we're supposed to sit there in our little desk, think groovy revolutionary thoughts, and <laughs> how awesome is that, right? But the system can handle millions of individual academics thinking revolutionary thoughts. 
What it can't handle is when they get together and think together and do things together. <laughs> so that's in the end. Recognizing this is a collective project, we have to think it through together, and we have to build it together, and we have to build movements that bring people who don't already agree with us in conversation with each other, right? Because we can talk to the same people who agree with us, but it's only when we grow that, again, the system gets challenged. But this requires, again, a spirit of humility, a spirit of we don't actually know the answers. I call it embracing failure. Embracing mistake is our methodology. Being okay to fail 100 times before we finally take off because it's in the failures that we learn something different. Um, so to me, that's it. Like, we don't have to know the answers, but together we know the answers. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to the, to the original question, the advice. I want to go back to the original question about the advice, what advice I will give um, a seminarian uh, now that I'm kind of in my middle age crisis, right? Um, <laughs> um, it gets worse. Yeah, right? <laughs> um, I, I, I will, uh, as a, you know, I'm doing footnotes here, I'm footnoting people so I can like get my, my stuff together. And the advice that I will start by, by just telling you, um, I will start by just telling you, I know, um, just be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, just be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, be humble, be bold, be courageous, and yes, be a revolutionary because we need revolutionaries within the church. Uh, don't, uh, don't see the challenges in front of you and then get this kind of methodological pa uh, paralysis, kind of, oh my God, I don't know what to do. But let the Holy Spirit guide, guide you. Um, at the same time, um, you know, what Jonah and Professor Jen Jennings was saying about, you know, like, when we don't want to obey the Spirit, uh, because we know that that obedience will somehow, will be costly. Um, you know, a Amos Young has been here, the professor who has uh, written the most about uh, neumatology, but his books will not sustain you in that process when you are um, really in the midst of the crisis because you obey the Holy Spirit and you are challenging a system. Um, so my advice, I mean, is quite kind of simple uh, in, in those kind of terms, spirituality, and, and be sustained by that spirituality. What, can I just um, probe a little bit? Would, would that advice prevent the, the problems that past missionary efforts have engaged, the ones we've discussed in, in many of our papers? So it's a, we got a question earlier today. Um, how do we stop making these mistakes in missions? Like we've, we've, we talked about genocide. We talked about um, colonialism. Would your advice, the advice you just gave, would it help? Would, would that help prevent some of these horrors that we've been describing? It will help if you have people, as, as I really like Jonah's uh, presentation, the, the lady from InterVarsity, because if you have people telling you, hey, you are really, really wrong here, you are like messing up badly, I, I hope that you get it and don't <laughs> like continue, you know, in that path of really messing things up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I hope that, that we have those kinds of friendships uh, that can somehow pull us from, from, from our own, uh, you know, um, sick nature in a way, uh, who can pull us from, from our own self, mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we have to understand that missionaries, uh, in the missionaries we, have, we find uh, the goodness of God and the grace of God uh, but also the, the, the stupidity and the evil of human nature. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is in those moments 
where we should have very good friends mm -hmm. uh, to prevent us from, from ourselves in a way. Mm -hmm. Andy, you wanna? I was going to say, I think it's important to institutionalize self-critique. It's not enough to just self-reflect, mm -hmm. but you need to have that part of the process itself. Like, for instance, in one organization I was in, every year we would look at what issues do we seem like we're not doing a good job in. We would then do a process of education. We would come up with an action plan. We would develop it. And by doing it collectively, we became less defensive because it felt less like, oh my God, I'm oppressive. And it's more like we have adopted a common political project to constantly be changing, learning, and educating ourselves. It didn't feel bad anymore. It felt positive, right? It felt part of our po politics of transformation. So I think it's key. It's not enough to just have friends, although that's cool. Make that part of the structure itself. Yeah. My feeling is, and I could talk at length about it, practical ways to make good structures, but I've learned that good structures uh, stop bad people from doing bad things and bad structures make good people do bad things, right? right? So having right. good structures make a big difference. And that's why the early church was so important. It wasn't enough just to be filled by the spirit. There needed to be structures <laughs> that enabled the spirit to operate effectively. Yeah. Andrew? I, I think that's why especially, well, for white folks, especially white males, uh, we need to intentionally uh, belong in spaces, as I mentioned earlier, where we are not in charge, mm -hmm. where uh, we are not familiar with the lay of the land, where we are uncomfortable, um, not because it pulls the focus out of intentionality. Um, in, in a focus, a sort of circular focus on intentionality is, is like a spiral of guilt. It, it is a trap of the enemy to have you so focused on self that you cannot find any, any way out of that death spiral. Uh, and it's part of the self-deification of whiteness. Uh, if we are in situations where by definition we are challenged, by definition we are confronted, then we're not having to defend ourselves as we are good white people or woke people or on the inside of race relations or whatever the case might be. But no matter how often I try to articulate something like that, the pushback still comes from my white brothers and sisters constantly about why are you saying we are bad people? Why are you pushing back on whiteness? Why? Are you, I mean, and, and again, this is not like a white fragility thing of saying I don't want to be criticized, but just, just know that when you are pushing back against systems and structures, white evangelicals hear it as uh, simply an interpersonal critique of intention, and then they send hate mail all day long, you know? So I have, <laughs> no, seriously, my extended family, my extended family regularly sends me inbox messages of, of we are so disappointed in you. You know, people regularly, white, white males find this that, you know, when, when my Fuller blog post came out, right? Like I would get emails from people who I don't even know who you are and you launch in right away to just being rude, mm -hmm. just cutting, just criticizing. And why? Why the defensiveness? If we're not pushing back against something that needs to be pushed back on, why the defensiveness? Why are you so invested in being right? Why do you care? Why are you so invested in, in, in your whiteness that, that, that you, you can't simply say, you know what, I, I'm going to listen here, I'm going to learn here, and, and I'm going to be wrong. That, that's the incarnation, isn't it, right? Like God made vulnerable. So of all people, mm -hmm. Christians should be those most open yeah. to being vulnerable and having to learn and be taught. And yet we see our, our calling as primarily one of education, proclamation, control. And I'm not knocking missions in the sense of, in the sense of, 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 of wanting to be joined with other people who are also making the journey to the story of Jesus Christ. Like that is beautiful and that needs to be navigated in, in important ways. But, but why the defensiveness to, to uh, uh, doubling down on it being my story? I, I, don't, I don't understand that. 
Anyway, it is a very big question, and together we can uh, move towards answers that will help. But I thought the theology that came to this country was also a troubled theology, wasn't it? Whether it came from Spain, uh, I was told to Florida for the first time before the Pilgrim Fathers came to this country. It was a politicized uh, theology. They borrowed it from the Greeks and the Romans and adapted it for their political purpose and territorial purposes. And when they were not able to deal with it, they exported it here. And here, the people began to work with that exported theology and had to listen and do what they were told. But when freedom comes, how do you deal with that kind of theology? If the Greek, Greco-Roman methods fail, the world is much bigger than these concepts. Why not go to learn something from China or from, from India? And so these, these models existed long, long before these older cultures. And that is one of the beauty of worldwide Christianity, what we call world Christianity. Many people see different things in different ways, but together we can get a fuller picture. Amen. Fuller picture of how these people in their critical situation saw and how it can, we can learn. So as an inspiration, as a warning, as a learning together. So seminary is a very good place to sow ideas and experiment with ideas at least for three or four years. So when our friends go out, and that is the time they really mean to exercise that, uh, that um, concepts. I, I hope, friends, in the coming years, um, non-European or non-American, uh, non-US American theologies are mandatory for all. And because we belong to one another and we grow together. Thank you. Um, I got a question here um, that reminded me of uh, another issue that's come up a couple times. Human history seems to me to be a history shaped by narratives of domination and supremacy. In a sense, whiteness is the, is the quote, modern death narrative. What would be the equivalent death narrative in the New Testament times? Um, and there was some, maybe it's just my associative brain. <laughs> Um, but I went from there to thinking about how the issue of violence has come up a couple of times. Uh, Daniel White Hodge really, um, I think, pushed on something when he talked about, you know, when is the time to, um, to exert violence in self-defense? Uh, I've been discussing this question with my students uh, recently, the, um, the Antifa movement. Um, and it, it, it seems to me that there's a greater currency for that kind of thing in my students today than when I first started teaching this class 10 years ago. So I, I was curious if um, any of the panelists wanted to jump in on that. I think it's interesting that our theology has gotten so widenized that we don't see the Bible as also a, a Bible under colonialism, right? Like it's a, a book written by colonized people <laughs> in colonial times, um, essentially a, a survival for under conditions of colonialism. And people, the dominant society reads themselves in the position of those being colonized instead of the Romans, which would actually be their positionality. And so I think if we maybe reflect, you know, change our lens and say, what is the scripture telling us when we see it as a text about colonialism? Uh, I think we would read everything very differently. Like the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? That is a major decolonial statement right there, right? But we, it's been, we've neutered it from its meaning because we don't look at it from the p position of decolonization, but that's what the text is embedded in. Yeah. Dr. Jennings? Um. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to make cl clear my dear sister, what you had, what you had said about um, violence. Mm -hmm. So j could you clarify just a bit, because I don't want, mm -hmm. I don't want to speak into mm -hmm. um, the void without being clear. What, what are you thinking when you say? So mm -hmm. uh, there are two issues, perhaps, mm -hmm. but maybe interlocking. OK. Um, one question has to do with um, the When is it a, when, uh, 
we have a narrative of nonviolence yeah. in our tradition. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, is that narrative of for nonviolence sufficient? Yes. In today's um, today. Yes. In yes. this present yes. Yes. dangerous moment where yes. Yes. marginalized people are being further marginalized, and um, it, I mean, it's causing uh, some of us to rethink a whole lot of, of things that we might. Have. And I've and I've noticed that the whole movement, the uh, Antifa, it's a a movement where some pro protesters are vowing to put their bodies on the line to resist with violence when fascists got you, got you, I got you now. Yeah. Are, are threatening yeah. nonviolent protesters. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, so, there, so that's one, one aspect of it. it. It has to do with self-defense. Got you, got you. Yes, I've heard this many times. But the, yeah. the, you said it was two parts. It was, yeah. And the second part was... So the, the, there was that question, and there was a question about the, I, I think it had to do with uh, thinking about the New Testament text. This is where Andrew was picking up on. Yeah. Um, and the, the violence there. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So reflecting on, on the, the fact that we had the people of God experiencing Roman yes. domination. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I always try to make a distinction between perennial challenges and particular problems that are pressing on us at the moment. I think there are some perennial challenges that come with being a Christian. And my colleagues have spoken brilliantly to this. And I'll just um, summarize in my own thinking what one of the kind of perennial challenges that many have already spoken to. One of the perennial challenges for us is to yield to the spirit to draw us to people we would prefer not to be drawn to. And I think that's, that's just a fundamental reality that we Christians have to face. We resist the spirit daily. And fundamentally, we don't want to go to the people the spirit is driving us toward because it is to make us vulnerable, as you said so wonderfully. And we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be with people who can reject us. Yes, that's right. But remember, that is the fundamental condition of being a, Christ, being a Gentile. You are joining another people's reality. That's the fundamental reality of being a Christian. You are in a position of vulnerability, of needing to be accepted. And the, that this is a fundamental challenge for us. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want to be with people who may say to us, I don't want you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Spirit is driving us mm -hmm. always toward each other. So th that's, that's, the, that's just the fundamental reality. We could also say that as a, a kind of fundamental struggle, but this comes to the contemporary moment, is the struggle against violence. And I, I can't say this strongly enough. Violence is never an option. I'm, I'm going to make sure I get this very clear. Violence is already becoming an agent of death. There is no in-between. Now, Self-defense is obviously the rationale put out in front of us to seduce us to violence. Protect yourself. But we have to understand, my sisters and brothers, this is very important for us to stand. You are in the country that is the greatest producers of weapons the world has ever seen. You are, in the, you are in the belly of the beast. More weapons are produced right here than any place else in the world. We sell weapons to the entire planet. So to think that you can handle violence is the greatest seduction that you could ever fall to. You cannot handle violence. <laughs> violence will only produce violence. There is no end to violence. Violence is, the, it is the creator, it is the false creator telling you that you can re recreate your world. Can I play devil's advocate? Let me just say one more thing about them. So here is the thing. 
Violence can only be meant with one fundamental choice. Either make it God or resist it with another God. That's the only choice you have. Violence will not give you it. There's no in-between. Because once you start, you will have to continue. You have to continue. Violence will not say, okay, that's enough. That's enough. One gun, no, you don't need one. Get another gun. No, not two guns, get another gun. That's the way it works. We are, we are immersed in it. We are under it. And the only way to not yield to it is to turn to someone who said, put down the damn sword. Mm-hmm. All right, now. Yeah, so um, <laughs> in these conversations I was having with my students about Antifa, right, that we were very clear about the perspective you just named. Um, but it also occurred to me as I had uh, studied the um, history of the civil rights movement that, um, that many of the protesters intentionally placed themselves in the way of violence. Right? So there was a strategic engagement with violence, not in an offensive way, but as a, really as a way to provoke a witness. Um, so it, 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 it just seemed to me that there is, a, there is reflection on violence that's, that's necessary. Um, oh, I see some more questions coming. Um, also, though, yes. we have to expand what we're saying by violence because violence isn't just getting a gun. Violence is living here in the United States yes. right now right. on stolen indigenous land, right? Mm-hmm. It's living in a society that extracts resources from other countries that then causes the premature death of other people. So I, I feel like sometimes there's a, a tendency for people to feel like they have clean hands. Like, I'm nonviolent, and those people are bad and violent. But no, there is no nonviolent approach under conditions of white supremacy and settler colonialism, right? We can be anti-violent. We can try tr- to resist violence. But no, nobody's hands are clean, you know? Yeah, and uh, and I I I also want to play the devil's advocate in in this in this in this important issue. uh, Is the discussion is this only about America, or are we thinking about Christians in 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 Palestine? Mm -hmm. Are we thinking about Christians in South Africa? Mm -hmm. So are we? uh, So I think we also need to be we need to contextualize this issue. Mm -hmm. We we shouldn't use the American standard as the normative. You know, life is not one size fits all. I think we also have to think about other contexts and see how, you know, we can also, you know, understand what's going on in other places. So America is not the only example that we should, we should, we should, yeah, USA or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So I, I just think I should bring that into the discussion and also look at, you know, the situation in South Africa. Look at, you know, even, you know, Desmond Tutu actually defending a little bit, a little bit of violence in, in certain, in certain, you know, in certain, you know, in, in, a, in a, you know, in, you know, sometimes, you know, that, you know, that maybe violence can actually, actually help to, 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 to prick the conscience of the oppressor. And, you know, look what happened to apathy, you know, so eventually, Eventually, there, there, was, there, was, there was a solution to the problem. No, that's why we say, you no, know, world Christianity is an answer. <laughs> we are not as, uh, isolated from the rest of the world. The more we are open to learn from one another, the better we will become. So whether it's South Africa, or Christians in China, or in Australasia, or the Philippines, where they are in a small number, but do great things together, and resist the dominant forces for not only in for decades, for sometimes for centuries. And their um, examples can help us. Sometimes the biblical interpretations that we use are so weak and so insular, and we think we are the best. It is a human tendency to think so, but we can say no, in the body of Christ we belong together, and the way how my sisters and brothers in other parts of the world live also counts. And we can live to get together. We are stronger. Dr. Jennings. Uh, just one brief thing, then, then we can move on to something else. Uh, about 
this matter of violence and guns. <laughs> uh, sisters and brothers, let's remember, uh, weapons are being exported in all those places that you just mentioned, being made here and elsewhere. <laughs> so, uh, right, one size doesn't fit all, but guess what? One set of guns are fitting all. <laughs> And they're all over the place. And th this is what I want us to understand. Every place that's in turmoil right now, you will find it awash with weapons made here. Yeah. Mm. So now let's be clear. We are connected by the gun. Mm -hmm. So we can pretend, mm. but we are connected by the gun. Mm. And any talk of violence, the people who make guns are applauding, or yes, <laughs> cha-ching, because money is being made hand over foot. Now, I agree with what my dear sister said. Look, there is, and I agree with what my dear sister here said, listen, there, there are multiple levels of violence, but what we have to understand is that part of the way capitalist logic works is to build in us the sense of the necessity for weapons. So this is a fight <laughs> that we have to win as Christians. <laughs> we have to win the fight against making violence or as, as an option. Or guess what? We can mail it in. <laughs> because if Christians justify violence, we're through. Thank you. I work in a community. I work in a community that is beset by violence. So many different forms of violence. The violence of poverty. When systemically we create the kind of environment where communities have everything sucked out of them and everything that's toxic brought to them. We're dealing with heavy metals being placed right down the block from us, disposed of illegally. We had to go taking pictures, et cetera, et cetera. What it does to the children. Everything is violence. I don't have a single student that does not understand life without violence. And 80% of the children in the public school are beset by trauma because of the diversities of violence. And I can only say that I haven't found one, it, it can't be stopped. It's, it, it perpetuates. Mm. And the implications of what violence means for everything, for the land that we're on, mm. Mm. you can't churn the earth in Philadelphia without knowing that you're churning contaminated earth, okay? And what that does to our bodies, what violence does to your mind, because then you can't even learn right, because trauma has its own chemistry in the brain and it forms the brain differently. And I have students who are brilliant, but then they have those days when they can't figure out that two plus two is four, and that's not an exaggeration because the, the chemistry isn't working. And then I have the ones who, the only way that they've been able to make a living is to be in the military. Okay? For generations, the high school that had the most persons die in the Vietnam War is across the street from where I work. So it's the community that's there. 
It's violence upon violence upon violence, and it never brings life. And as the people of God, we have to represent life and light and love. Now, know this. There are times, and I don't say this lightly, my first day, my second day on the job, I had to place myself between a student and a perpetrator of violence. I had to place my body there. I had to place my psyche there because when the person, you see, when you put yourself there, there's an authority that you have. <laughs> violence is a demon. We spoke about the, de- the demonic, right? Yes. Violence is a demon. Yes. And to have the spirit is very important. To have the spirit is very important. I have to make a choice. I had to make a choice. Either this violence that's taking place is going to perpetuate itself, is going to end in something really bad, and when someone dies, everybody in that family, everybody in that community, every, it, it just it stays for a long time. I have just gotten two other questions about violence. So this is a, this uh, conversation has really stimulated something among some in our audience. And I think that um, we have, uh, I think it's clear that the folks here have put a, a marker down in, in terms of uh, a commitment to the Christian tradition of nonviolence. Um, I, think that that, I think that's clear. Um, but for instance, this uh, last one, uh, who gets to define what violence is? Um, the, there, I, think, I think even as we affirm our tradition, we need to realize who we're talking to and that there is a generation who, who are not engaging the... Um, Right. Yeah. 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 And no, go ahead. You jump in. I mean, I'm 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 in conversations with sisters and brothers across the country, young sisters and brothers for whom, you know, they were they didn't have any nonviolence training. They, you know, for as far as they're concerned, uh, picking up a weapon is an option. And I res I respect I respect that position. I don't want. Son of I don't respect that position. And I certainly respect what my sister just said so beautifully and eloquently. What my sister had said earlier, there are multiple kinds of violences. Yeah. I mean, realities of structural violence and so forth. I, I'm, we are clear on these things. And so the question is, how do we stand against yeah. Yeah. all these forms of violence? But what I want to, and I'm, I don't want to be the dead horde or re- repeat myself endlessly, but... What I want to make sure I get across is just this crucial matter of the the seduction of power and agency that comes with thinking that violence is an option. This is a seduction. You, you don't step into your agency by doing violence. It, it isn't a stepping into freedom. That's the lie. That's the seduction. That if I... If I can step into violence, I will clear the way for my voice to be heard. Your voice will never be heard. All that will be heard is the violence. And see, here, and I, I had a long conversation with a dear brother uh, just a few months ago who said, Dr. Jennings, listen, I just want to tell you, I'm, if a dear mother has lost her son to the police and she has another son, and the police comes, as far as I'm concerned, she can get a weapon and defend herself and her son. And I said, my dear brother, I understand what you're saying, but do you think that's an option for her? It's an option for her to stand in front of police officers with a weapon to defend her son. That, that's an option? Then what? Then what? What have you drawn her into? 
that she can never escape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's agency and freedom, but it is the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And so, last time I say this, as a Christian, <laughs> we have another way. Amen. That is not the way for us. Amen. That's not what we, that's not the power we present. And if we cannot see another way at the moment when the world says, this is the way, we're done. We're done. Because the resurrection means, you, know, you all know your Bible, those who all their life were captive, not by death, mm -hmm. but by the fear yeah. of death. <laughs> It wasn't death. It was the fear of it that kept them in bondage. And if you pick up a gun, welcome to your bondage. Well, friends, we are out of time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to CP time. <laughs> um, I do have one last one that I actually would really love to, um, the panel there entertain. Uh, the frequency of unarmed shootings of black people, of DACA, so many other events have left many at the margins with deep pain and trauma in 2017. What would you say to people of color as we struggle to live in hope and consider divorcing evangelicalism? <laughs> I know. Oh, thank you. Oh, I think I think that's fine, but I don't know why white people get to define evangelicalism. They get they, they get to define everything. I don't really see anything to white people, and I think that's why we're having the conference to say no. People of color can define the terms of this faith. So I say join our conference in two years, and, I, <laughs> and let's take this stuff over, right? Let's, let's not put ourselves in the margins. Let's claim the center and do, some, do things differently and say this is the faith that we, we stand for, right? Let's stop asking to be included and say we're building our own thing and you can join our t party. I just redeemed some time somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Redeem the time. <laughs> Others will want to engage that question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got my, get my glasses on again. <laughs> the, frequency, the frequency of unarmed shootings of black people, DACA, and so many other events have left many at the margins with deep pain and trauma in 2017. What would you say to people of color as we struggle to live in hope and consider divorcing Evangelicalism. Hope has come. Well, I put it to you this way. I had a young woman come to me. She's 35 years old. She started running around with men twice her age at the age of 13. She was pimped by them. She goes to jail because she's implicated in a crime that took place. She did her time. She came out. She came to the college. And she had a different chance to finally redefine her life. And she has five children, and she's finally redefined her life. She lives in the community, and her brother is murdered. Mm. No one dares to say anything on the block. Everyone knows who murdered him. No one dares to say anything on the block. There's this very, very, very silent funeral and there's this silence because of fear. She rises up and she says, what is wrong with us? Who died here, a dog? And she organized the community. She visited everybody and she talked about the fears and she said, and, and there were people who had started buying their guns and they were ready. And she said, that's not going to do it because you just murder another brother. And she organized everyone to speak the truth about what they're feeling.
And out of speaking that truth about what they were feeling, they didn't give up the person who did the murdering because they understood what, what was happening in his own heart. Do you understand? Because if they give him up, where's he going to go? To the violence of the state into the, the incarceration. And they decided to take it into their own hands. And they brought that person to accountability and to healing. And the way that she made that happen was tremendous. Oh, wow. Praise God. She started it and she ignited something in every single person. What she ignited was that there was a hope that could go beyond their fear. That they should dare and have the courage to go beyond their fear. And to see what it would look like. Because when they started talking, they didn't know what it looked like. But they had a faith that something might happen. That she's Latina. There was a mother of the church that she knocked on the door, an 80-year-old woman. And she helped her to understand the spirituality of the whole piece and gave her courage and ways of defining it and told her, honey, what you have is faith. Yeah. Mm. Don't let your faith die. That didn't just come from you. Yeah. You're speaking out and what you have is faith and I'm going to speak out in prayer and we're going to do this together. Yeah. Now, she couldn't walk. She said, you're going to have to go out and talk to everybody. I'll tell you how to talk to them because I've lived here a long time and I know how to tell, tell you how to talk to them. And, and she used what faith she had and the, the, the wisdom of this woman. And this woman united her faith with her. It's a spiritual peace. Yeah, yeah. We, have to, we have to come into the power of what Jesus really is. We don't know what that is. We've been dealing with this pseudo-Christianity. And we don't know what that is. Andrea, you challenged us rightly that we have to be born again. And that we have to live into a faith that we don't know what it looks like. But we have to dare to go beyond those pieces and to believe that something can happen in that moment. We have to see ourselves as the instrument of peace, of life, of love, of light. Because that is how Jesus defined himself. And this young woman was able to begin to see something change. Yes, let's hide the person who was the perpetrator. We know why we have to hide him. Not for the reason that he wants to hide. We're going to hide him for our own reasons because we have to save him. And they saved him together with their hope that something could happen outside of fear. To pick up that gun is to continue to live in fear. You, you buy that gun, you live with that gun because you live in fear. Instead, they had a hope. And they surrounded him. They called him to accountability. They confronted him. And they said, we're not giving you up. We're going to surround you in love. But we can't continue to live this way on this block. And then they went and started dealing with the other issues. That selling drugs is an alternative economy. And so now they're dealing with what would it mean for us to deal with the economic empowerment pieces. She can't get a job because she's a felon. This is her job. So she's had to find other ways to sustain herself. But do you see what can happen? Do you see what can happen if you dare to imagine outside of the damn gun? Yes. That is not our option. It is not our option. There is the hope of the rebirth of the true Christ. It's just that we can't see it because we have all this other stuff all on top of us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
right? <laughs> and the reason, the reason why we dare, the reason why you're getting all that mail and stuff is because this is systemic. If you change, other people are gonna have to go down with you in the change. <laughs> Andrew, you want and I say that because the rebirth is about the change, right? So that's, they're, they're afraid of your change, honey. That's what makes you powerful. They're afraid of your change because they're going down with it. But that power that they have is the only thing they've known. And the true power that Christ calls us to is a very different peace. And we don't know the fullness of the power that we really, really, really have. We don't know what the fullness of that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is about moving into the fullness of a very different power, of the rebirth that you challenged us to. When you challenged us to rebirth, I sat back there because it's not as cold back there. I love it here. <laughs> I love it here with these lights. They're keeping me warm. <laughs> but I sat back there and I said, Jesus, I repent and I want the rebirth. Yes, yes. And I repented back there because it starts with repentance. So if I'm going to call you to an altar call, don't come up. Stay right where you are. Your altar is right where you are. It's in your heart. What is it that we want to repent of today? What is the message that we have to bring out? What is it that we don't know about Jesus that we have to know? And I don't want to leave here tonight without knowing what it is. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to make one connection between modern institutionalized violence and whiteness. While we understand that violence has been ubiquitous throughout human history, Cain and Abel is a story of violence. There's an especial trick in modernity to think that we can be co-creators with God in a way that, that our humanity itself, uh, that, that, that our capacities are what, the capacities that we share with the divine is what makes us human. And that is, that is the pri primary or dominant analogy of being in relation to the Imago Dei throughout medievalism. And in the colonial mo moment, it was married into an idea of being able to order the world, as Dr. Jennings has clearly articulated. But I think it's important to remember, we as modern people, we can't create anything out of nothing, right? Like, like humans cannot create ex nihilo. All we can do is, is kill. Uh, in fact, modern medicine... And, and, and so much of, of what, what we are involved in in modernity to help and heal is really killing. You know, like right now, my, my father is, is going through chemotherapy for, for lymphoma, right? And, and it, it's inherently a violent act. Mm -hmm. And so there are other ways of being and knowing in the world that give life in, in ways, put a cold cup of water, a warm towel on a forehead, you know, there are, are ways of relating that are not tied into modernity. My, my point is that the modern project, the white project, is inherently violent yes. because it assumes the ability to do what only God can do. When all that we can do is do what the enemy does, and that's steal, kill, and destroy. It's only God who can give life. And if it's only God who can give life, every time we take the reins of violence, it is by necessity demonic. I would like to end in prayer.
Holy Father, Sovereign Lord, You are the God who sits on high, but sees very low. Lord God, you see the black girls that no one else sees. Lord, you see the yellow girls that no one listens to. Lord, you see the brown girls that I stepped on, Lord. Lord, you see all of us in all of our brokenness. God, we cry out to you. This is a world that we didn't choose. This is a world that doesn't seem to know who you are. But God, I pray that you would give us the strength to hold on. Yes, Lord. Lord, we have heard your call. God, we set ourselves to follow Jesus, to walk the way of the cross, and to by your strength, we shall overcome the forces of evil. We shall overcome the principalities and the powers that seek to divide and to destroy. God, I pray that you will take these humble thoughts, Lord, that we attempted to follow close to your heart. We, went, we, we tried to hear what you said to us and to speak truth so that there would be a word for your people. And Lord, these... Our efforts, Lord, they're not enough in these troubling days. But we know who you are. You are the God of all power. God, you have created this world and you know us intimately. God, you know the future that we can't see. And God, we know that one day we will see your face. In the meantime, Lord God, we pray that you would give us hope. Lord, we want to be a people called by your name. And beyond that, Lord, we want nothing else. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would attend to each and every heart that's in this room, that you would bind up the wounds, that you would give the balm of your spirit, and Lord, that you would give us a chance that you would give us the strength to just go one more day. By your power, Lord, by your glory, we give you all the honor and praise. It's in Christ Jesus' name, our Savior, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please join me in gratitude for the labor of these, your brothers and sisters in Christ. (laughs) 